aircraft carriers were bringing vehicles and machines back and forth. And so the concept of knowing that something was going on like a war in a place like Vietnam was in my mind stream at quite a young age. And it seemed like a bad concept. I, it seemed like, why would anyone want war? It sounded horrible. And then an uncle of mine who I had seen as a child all of a sudden wasn't there in my life anymore because he had to go and was drafted to, to serve in this war. So, you know, it was very early age that these places and these scenarios where Thich Nhat Hanh would actually in that moment himself be rising up in the midst of that to be a counterforce of peace and of sanity and of compassion amidst that, that you know, little blip in my childhood, he was already in the robes thinking about this very wonderful presence of a way to respond through the force of the Dharma as a monk and not by just sitting quietly in a temple or running off somewhere up into the jungles to just meditate and pray for peace, but to actually take his practice on the road and stand for peace. And I found later when I came into the teachings that he was writing, The Miracle of Mindfulness, I think was one of the first books I found later in the 90s or early 2000, that, you know, this made so much sense to, to what I had already been doing in my life more as kind of as an educator, as someone who had engaged with environmental issues and also with peace activism. I was in Berlin after the wall opened four months later, I was there for the first time and then later moved there and from 1993 to 97 was engaged in a lot of peaceful movements. And again, in, in a moment in 1995, when Christo had wrapped the whole Reichstag, there were 250,000 people one Friday evening in June gathered in front of it with tea lights. My friends wanted to, to go up and make a, a joyful dance in front of the building. <laughs> And as we were walking up from very far away, I just kept looking at all the blankets and all the beautiful faces, old, young, different ages, different races. And that this concept again of mindfulness, pay attention, be aware, see this very clearly. It's very important and profound, this sense of oneness and peace. And again, it was prior to seeing Thich Nhat Hanh's work then about what he had already been doing since his engaged practice of Buddhism in the 70s in Vietnam and then founding. I wasn't particularly at that point interested in becoming a monastic or in even following a tradition, honestly, because I felt even in Buddhism, all of the world religions had been so heavily patriarchal. They weren't really that compelling to a young woman born in 1966 who had the opportunity to get educated who went to a great liberal arts college here in Maine and then who was really compelled by engaged social movements and education, peace, compassion. Um, but it seemed that the, the, the package of organized religion was not really open and equally welcoming to those of us in the female form. So I had done a lot of secular work in areas that were really of importance to me. My first job was on the environmental movement for the city of Cambridge in the energy office. Then I was working in HIV AIDS. I wrote the first thesis at Bates on that topic and not just on the healthcare response, but on how homophobia was so cruel and unjust as well as the fear around hemophilia, the way Ryan White was treated, a young boy here in the US. There was such a confluence of human fear with the need of a medical response that I was really engaged with that work for several years. And then eventually went to Berlin, went to Amsterdam for the AIDS conference in 92 and visited Berlin again and saw how much things had changed that I moved there in 93 to participate in the great social change that was happening as an educator, as a social, as a photographer, documentary photographer. So in this moment in 95, this mindfulness came. And when I moved back to the States in 97, I was living across the street from Smith College in Northampton, so the whole library was there. And I think it was there that I met a first practicing Buddhist who invited me to sit zazen with a, with a group um, that Suzuki had founded that was still practicing in the five college area of Western Mass. And then someone gifted me this 
book of Thich Nhat Hanh with mindfulness. And I thought, oh, it's great. It's really a practice. That's wonderful. I mean, it had only been kind of in my mind stream, but I didn't know that someone had really devoted already this huge practice of both engaged Buddhism and mindfulness with peace and compassion and had already spread these seeds so far and wide. So then I researched more on Thich Nhat Hanh and found out that he had been nominated by Martin Luther King Jr. for the Nobel Peace Prize. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this in his nomination of Thai for the Nobel Prize. Thich Nhat Hanh is a holy man for he is humble and devout. He is a scholar of immense intellectual capacity. His ideas for peace, if applied, would build momentum to ecumenism, meaning uh, interfaith, to world brotherhood and sisterhood, and to humanity. I inserted sisterhood there. It says only to world brotherhood. But Thich Nhat Hanh also did so much for the female bhikkhuni sangha to raise up the status within his own Sangha of Plum Village to insist on understanding that the Buddha founded the fourfold Sangha of bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen, and laywomen to be four pillars to uphold the Dharma equally. But within the ordained Sangha, especially as the ones who would be the teachers and leaders of the Sangha, by living the Dharma in a much more pure way, for example, being celibate for committing to not owning property, for committing to living in community, for committing to holding the Dharma in intense, difficult times when outside forces are, are working to degenerate it. He said, yes, of course, the Buddha himself recognized that the females also have the mind, which is what becomes enlightened, and therefore within his own Sangha had made so much clear foundational uh, directives amongst the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis that they were to be seen with each other as equal and that the elders were to be seen with seniority the way one would view the mother or this as equal age a sister or as a younger one a young sister that there was a sense of family and togetherness and equality so the way he established Plum Village, I also thought was quite profound because so much of his early work, since he was, he was thrown out of his mother country, he was not allowed to stay in Vietnam. So he came also as a refugee living in France and then later doing a lot of his great work in establishing his, his Plum Village centers here in the United States. And upon reflection of his life, I thought how fantastic that someone in robes, a bhikkhu, stood up in the midst of bombs, created this engaged applied Buddhism, peaceful mindfulness movement, and then came to countries that were actually formerly in his country oppressors. The French had a long history of colonization in Vietnam. The United States were the ones dropping the bombs you know, in the midst of that time. And the Dharma is so beautiful and profound when it's lived purely by a master like Thich Nhat Hanh, to be able to just simply and humbly walk the walk, walk the path, not talk much more than what was needed to share, create the beautiful ritual of the mindfulness bell, and always bringing back the awareness of the liberating message of the Buddha Dharma to freedom being found within our own body, our own speech, our own mind. And so, you know, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. mentioned that Thich Nhat Hanh was even at that time a prolific scholar. He's become even more so through the greater next decades of his life. Um, I would read many of his books, Being the Lotus, Going Home, Jesus and Buddha as Brothers, The Miracle of Mindfulness, on and on and on, Love, The Power of Love, he, he's written prolifically. And then I had the chance in 2017, when I was in Hong Kong for this beautiful conference called Sakyadita of Buddhist women gathering. It's open to monks and it's open to any laymen and laywomen, but it's primarily Buddhist nuns from every tradition, from the Theravada, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. I had the wonderful opportunity to actually live with his community out on Lantau Island in Hong Kong, where Plum Village has a very small and beautiful center of applied Buddhism. 
and they're very welcomed me. I literally showed up on their doorstep as a beggar. The conference had ended. We had been housed at Hong Kong University and my flight was still four days out or five days out. So I needed a place to stay for four nights and I showed up and just requested humbly, may I stay with you? They said, welcome sister, welcome. And the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis there were so lovely, such a beautiful sangha. And it's said within all the traditions, if you wanna know the quality of the master, whoever's leading that community, you can see their quality of their mind by how their sangha holds the Dharma. And really these precious sisters that I was living with, but we were practicing, the bhikkhus live next door. We all came together, did many lovely practices together. We did mindful walking together. This legacy that Thich Nhat Hanh has left behind him of the living sangha, holding up the Plum Village tradition. This is the way forward to honor his message of peace, of loving kindness, of mindfulness, taking responsibility to hold the Dharma purely through our own body, speech, and mind is his greatest gift that he really gave to us in this world right now, as much as his writing, but more so the living examples of his Sangha, of his ordained bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and his lay practitioners, so open-hearted, so joyful, so welcoming and kind. This is the true message. And this is a, these are exactly the qualities that the suffering world is in desperate need of today. So, so wonderful to live at Plum Village with them, practice with them, learn. I didn't know at first this mindfulness bell will go off every 15 minutes. <laughs> so when you live in the community, it's like that in the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis anyway. And so we just, whatever we're doing, stop. I invite you all now, stop. Breathing in, touching peace, breathing out, sharing peace. And this is such a profound practice. And if we do this at the, in, the, in the Plum Village, we would do this every 15 minutes on the hour, the quarter hour, the half hour, the three quarter hour, and then again on the hour. And just taking that, I mean, I don't know how you all feel, but I feel so much love and joy. I feel like Ty's right here in my heart when I'm doing this. And he is, and he knew that he was. He knew his deep essence as a Buddhist master that he's, transcending and part of everything that is of the light, that is of loving kindness, that is of compassion, joy, equanimity, serenity, immeasurably. He knew that the mind is already pervading everything that is. And the, the gifts that he has left are just reflections within our own walk now to carry these truths forward. So the other... Um, very personal, profound way, I'll say that Thich Nhat Hanh, I never had the blessing to meet him in person, but it didn't actually, honestly, it didn't matter. I feel that I've met him here in my own heart mind, which is the, the most deep place that we can meet anyone. And so two summers ago, I was on a long retreat at the nunnery with Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo. And I took this book out of her library. I highly recommend everyone to read it. Don't be daunted by its size, but if you haven't read it, Old Path, White Clouds. It's over 500 pages, but it is delicious. <laughs> it is not long and arduous. If you're reading it, walking in the footsteps of the Buddha, you know that Thich Nhat Hanh was with the Buddha when he lived, by the way he's encapsulated the presence and essence of the Lord Buddha by the beautiful storylines that he draws out of the children and their, their innocence and help to the Buddha, bringing rice milk, being of interest and in, in presence with him when he's first awakening in, his, in the Buddha's commitment to the ch young children to get old enough to join into the Sangha, but when they came of age to be able to join, he's unpacking this so beautifully. The quietness of the walking meditation that the Buddha did upon awakening. I think this is also one of Thich Nhat Hanh's most profound legacies that he helped with the West he knew that we couldn't sit very easily for a long time. He knew the Western mind very well after living in Europe and living in the US and understanding it's not easy 
for people to slow down in the West were very extroverted, very externally motivated. And the way he used walking meditation as a foundation for the practice of peace, step by step, was, is and was so profoundly beneficial to the Westerners especially. To do walking meditation, to be present as we, as we touch the earth, he said, as we touch the earth. I love one of his quotes that he said because he did a lot of um, contemplation and writing about Jesus and Buddha as brothers. And of course, in, in Christianity, Jesus walked on water as one of the miracles he displayed to show his disciples that he had sacred spiritual powers when they were out in the storm caught in the boat. He walked on water to say, look, it is me, your friend, I'm coming to you. Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, appreciated that story of how a master could show his disciples that he was still with them, even when they were fearing for their lives. In Thich Nhat Hanh's own beautiful way, though, he brought it back to earth for all of us so that we could relate to how we could just practice. And he said, the true miracle is to walk upon this earth. This everybody can do. He was opening it up to our ordinary, extraordinary qualities of being an embodiment of peace. Walking our walk gently, carefully, not stepping on insects, stepping lightly wherever our foot falls. And so he also organized many walking peace meditations, peace practices. And back in about 2009, there was also some of his sangha was walking in Brunswick, Maine and coming through. And so some of our sangha from our Tashi Getzeling went to meet them. We were all lay people at the time and our teacher was not with us, but our shrine room was set up so that we could welcome them as they were passing through Freeport, where our, our center used to be located, to be able to invite them to come in as they were passing through and feed them lunch to feed the Sangha lunch. And we walked with them quite a distance. And then we just said, let us leave now and we'll go prepare the lunch. And we spent a beautiful time together. They came and they, they prostrated to Maitreya. They saw the Tonka, they knew right away. So in essence, the Mahayana Sangha, whether you're Vajrayana or whether you're Zen or a blend of Zen and, and the specialness that Thich Nhat Hanh brought, which is a little bit a new kind of form of Zen means that we all see the oneness of what we're practicing. We're practicing developing this beautiful mind all the way up to the qualities of our Buddhahood. We're practicing our immeasurable loving kindness with altruism, our immeasurable compassion with altruism, our immeasurable joy with altruism, and our immeasurable equanimity, that serenity, that cool headedness, peaceful heart, compassionate mind that's always of benefit, especially when the situation gets very difficult externally. So always being other oriented, altruism means seeing that others are much more important, that the self is only one, this mere individual being here is only one, others are, are immeasurable, they're limitless. And so our concern obviously goes to taking care of the, the whole, the greater good of all, meets the greatest good of this one, because the greatest good is shared similarly. And Thich Nhat Hanh recognizes very well. And the master worked very, very effortlessly, it seemed on the outside, but I think tirelessly in his practice to bring about the fruits of the Dharma, to bring about this path of Buddhahood that unfolds with an enlightening intent and enlightening mind to be able to establish then centers all over the world through his first impulse in the midst of war to say no to violence, to say no to ignorance, to say no to aggression, to say no to greedy selfishness. And he gave us the example that if each of us puts deeply in our own heart minds these commitments, we too can make immeasurable, immeasurable contributions to the happiness and peace of this beautiful blue planet that we're sharing that we call home. And this is our time to practice. The Buddha foretold that there would be epidemics, there would be wars, there would be lots of anger and confusion and, and manipulation. The Dharma would maybe degenerate, 
that the value of Dharma would not be as appreciated, but we can see through Venerable Master Thich Nhat Hanh's life that this is not true. He upheld it purely, the same way His Holiness the Dalai Lama is upholding it purely. And these teachers are not saying we have to become Buddhist to do this. They are showing us as a Buddhist this example. To me, this was very compelling, so much so that years into my Dharma practice as a lay person, the aspiration to take the robes, to be able to carry this beautiful, precious message forward in the robes as part of the Dharma in the Sangha community in robes, because we need ordained monastics. If we lose the monastic community, if that way of life is no longer seen as valid and, and, and worthy and, and very precious, that means the fourfold Sangha is degenerating. So to, it also Thich Nhat Hanh created a, a much broader Sangha outside of Vietnam worldwide in the Plum Village Sangha. So this contribution, I just think many people listening are lay people. So to try to appreciate that contribution that he has created a vessel for the ordained Sangha to be maintained because that the Buddha himself said, if there is no more ordained Sangha, the Dharma itself is in danger of disappearing. So, you know, I'm not saying this for myself in any way to, that anyone has to appreciate what I'm sharing with you or that I took the robes, that, that the importance is, is that there are people, there are beings still in robes giving their life to the precious Dharma. So thank you for listening. I just, I can't really find words to honor Thich Nhat Hanh. The Venerable Master's life and his teachings are beyond anything that I really myself can offer, except my deep heartfelt gratitude and my own commitment to do what I can to carry on his message and his life work, to be of a source of peace, of loving kindness, compassion, with joy, of course, with joy. Tai was very playful. We have to have that. My joy often comes through walking, but also through some basketballing, which I find a lot of joy in, and, and through equanimity, through the serenity that doesn't fall into the, the lure of duality, which creates good guys and bad guys, or good gals and bad girls, or good side and bad side, that sees that everyone is the same, sharing the wish for happiness and not wanting suffering, and sharing the wisdom that sees that under the afflictions of ignorance, egoic greed, selfishness, and fear, hatred, aversion, that's how difficulties arise. But because they arise in human misunderstanding, it means human wisdom is capable of meeting these challenges and meeting it with loving kindness and with compassion, not with aggression, not with egoic pride of taking sides, who's right and who's wrong. Yes, preserving freedoms of democracy, preserving the freedoms that respect a plurality of beliefs. Of course, social democracy is wonderful for that, but we need also to, to do the internal work first to, to move through a mind of pure, clear, altruistic dedication through wisdom and compassion. We need to remove ignorance from our own mind streams, remove selfish, egoic, fear, greedy desires, as well as hatred and aversion. Then we can become really worthy and honorable vessels to walk the beautiful walk of mindfulness, to become the miracle of mindfulness, to really be the lotus that Thich Nhat Hanh was. He renounced this kind of suffering and fear. He renounced the samsaric world. He was opening up to blossom to this beautiful essence and presence of peace and a true teacher and a true master of the Buddha Dharma. So I want to stop here and see if maybe Geshe-la has joined us again. And um, thank you for listening to my sharing and my deep love and respect for Master Thich Nhat Hanh. And maybe geshe is ready now. Thank you for your eloquent sharing Venerable Tenzin Basil, and the, the words you found are truly inspiring, and I really appreciate the uh, the insights that you were able to share from the, such a vast array of Thich Nhat Hanh's work, so thank you so much. Um, and yes, please, Venerable geshe -la, if you uh, if you are able to speak, please, uh, please take your turn. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, um, Dexter, the coordinator. And also, uh, thank you, um, Tsuma Desela, 
this is a yes re recalling the life of a great master in fact i remember when i was being trained as a young monk when i was in my early 20s and 19 when i was 19 20 21 my teacher used to tell me that we need to read the biographies of the great masters and um, say the particularly the venerable master Pirmat Khan, and he really was a great example for all of us, and in many ways. And as um, the venerable Tessel already indicated, many points of uh, the venerable Pirmat Khan. And there are a few points which I like to particularly highlight. Is that for, for the world, why in the first place, why do why these great masters become very important for the world? And if the world is extremely happy, peaceful, in dialogue, there's no need of Buddha, there's no need of Jesus Christ, there's no need of Mahavi and so forth. The thing is that world is a ball of fire. The world, the, the world is in fire. So we need the enlightened beings to rescue the world. For that matter, enlightened beings, they came on this earth, like Buddha, Jesus Christ, Mahavira, Bahula, Guru Nanak, and so forth. But the point is that the, the followers, their messages must be carried forward by the followers. And we see that the, um, what the Venerable Malcolm, what he demonstrated, that is extremely, extremely important, the, the important point. And uh, he is really exemplified as a great Buddhist. And some of you will be wondering, what is Bodhisattva? Bodhisattva is some, the, some enlightened beings. So in fact, the Bodhi has a connotation of enlightenment, and Sattva has a connotation of the courageous one. So this is something so unique. There may be many teachers, but the quality, one of the greatest qualities of the Bodhisattvas is the courage. And if we look at his biography, we see that not only he started many centers, he actually had the, see, the step forward to, the, to be rebellious or to show his, the, how he is sort of against the Vietnam War and how he's against any kind of war. So this is a very clear indication. And then the, that led him to go into some, that led, led him to go into so much of personal pro the problems. These are all the courageous activities for the Bodhisattvas. And on top of that, the, we see that the, um, he also started, he also is also revered as the, the father of the mindfulness meditation. Uh, yes, that while his basic the philosophical principles, is a blend of Yogacara philosophy and Zen Buddhism. And yet his, the, the teaching on mindfulness, this is something so unique. And being a poet, his books really attracted so many people. In fact, I personally would say that the, um, the, he is one of the greatest Buddhist masters, masters in the world to inspire many people from his books. And you read them, they're so poetic, they're so beautiful, and the meanings are conveyed in the such a, the, in such a the fluid way, in a, such a simple way, yet very beautifully. 
So this is the part of his scholarship. And I really appreciate it. And uh, the, the closest the set up centers, many centers to inspire many people. So as I said earlier, a purpose for the enlightened beings, for them to come and serve, is to help the beings, help the beings in ways to change their thinking, to oppress The Buddha very clearly indicated that even if you have a beautiful mind, even if you have a beautiful eyesight, but without light, you cannot see what is around you. Likewise, without the dharma, even though you are so brilliant, you will not be in a position to know what is right, what is wrong. So for that matter, we need the great enlightened beings to share, to shower this light. And um, of course, his books really they demonstrate that he is. He actually uh, the, was one of the greatest bodhisattvas on the earth. And the, if you look at the bodhisattvas' activities, for example, say the uh, this what is known as the knowledge integrating and the love. Knowledge wise, there's a tremendous the display of the knowledge through his books, and then the integrity, amazing, great inspiration. Say only when somebody lives or walks the what he or what he teaches many will be inspired and look at him how many how many millions are being inspired by him and not only buddhists even non-buddhists they are so much inspired by him so and the next part is the love and affection so we look at how many people were there who see who could see the beauty of interdependency from reading his books and through uh, through the, his books of explaining the, the, the beauty of love and affection, the mutuality of love and affection. From this, the true explaining the interdependency. So, so many people, the drugs to the aversion, which otherwise was more like the, the, what was in the blood. So they dropped it and they could feel the interdependence, interdependence makes sense uh, uh, in the life. And from the Buddhist of the path, we see that there are what is known as the 10 perfections, six perfections and four perfections, and particularly in the context of the, the four perfections. Four perf perfections mainly to, uh, to nurture other beings, Bodhisattvas, as item and three are very clearly indicated the next text, Abhisamanakara, or Ornament of Clear Realization, that the, the Bodhisattvas, their main aspiration is to show the path to the people who aspire for a particular goal. And given that that is the case, um, the Bodhisattvas, they go, one of the goals is to nurture the beings well. And for nurturing the beings, these four professions were taught. Number one, skillfulness. Number two, aspirational, aspirational uh, prayers and aspirational the enthusiasm. Then the, the power. And finally, the discrimination of wisdom. So these four things are required for somebody to really help nurture other beings. And the first one, skillfulness. Same the the, you can see that his skills in explaining things so simply and very beautifully that really enchanted so many people to follow the Buddha's message in very simple ways. Then his aspiration, aspiration in action and aspiration in prayers is so powerful that he literally is ready to sacrifice himself for the cause of the humanity, for the cause of peace on the earth. Then the, the power in terms of his, the, his speech, 
that his influence is so powerful that many people are actually being moved by his teachings. And then the discriminatory wisdom that the, the manner in which he explains things so beautifully, the nuanced concepts in the single verse is a very clear indication that resonates with the, the power of the, the, the power of the discriminatory wisdom. And alongside that following the Bodhisattva the path is so important that uh, not only that you succeed in your practice, but to make sure that you help others in creating Sangha and the, the groups, centers. And so this is so important. Where you shine, but then your legacies must be as they carry forth by the other beings in the future. And to what extent you can be, say, spread this legacy of your goodness, of your compassion, of your wisdom, and so forth. So these centers will carry for this task. And he actually created this extremely beautiful the plum village or a monastery to carry for this mission. And then so many centers there. This is so courageous. And uh, in my personal life, I would say that is there, if there is anybody who not for any, who not for the same, as a, the expectation for name, fame, and so forth, just for the purpose of spreading the message of the Buddha and establishing centers and establishing institutions in order to disseminate this beautiful, the most, say, the, uh, the, the, uh, the important teaching of the message of the Buddha, the love, the universal compassion, and the wisdom. So that is extremely important, and I wholeheartedly revere those people. For example, my own teacher, the most venerable Dishi, Dr. although he did not really have any modern education, and yet he set up two extremely significant institutions, Institute of Buddhist Dialectics in the Rumsala, and the Sara Institute for Higher Studies in the the high studies in Buddhism, hand -to language. So he established these two institutions. And from there, so many people have graduated and who, each one of them, they make huge contributions to the spread of Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings, the message. So from this, what I'm saying is that I really near those people who involve themselves or who actively, who courageously take the responsibility to establish centers establish institutions in order to give the opportunity to, to so many other people. <clears throat> in this connection, they, I would say that uh, the, the master fell into the Tirunath Khan. So what they did was that he really inspired the, the women, he inspired the nuns. This is extremely, extremely important. And uh, this is my deep, deep, deep respect for Venerable Tunakam, that he really inspired the, every the part of the citizen of the, the world, the males, females, nuns, monks, or as all somebody is interested in the message of the Buddha, in the, the dialogue and the peace for the world, he's always there. So this is so, so inspiring. And to the, the uh, for his holiness, the Dalai Lama, and to dust to a really thing of the world rather than for the, the personal matters, personal interests. So they all say that there's a great barrier between the two great masters. So um, the, and looking at this, the, he was exiled and his holiness that they have also been exiled for all these more than 60 years. And, and both of them making such a great contribution the humanity and be working for the dialogue and totally against wars. And his own said that very clearly indicated that if the UN the, the abolishes capital punishment, he was the first signatory for this. This is all very inspiring. So the deep inside me, while the master, 
I can see that this tremendous degree of scholarship there, there's a tremendous degree of compassion there, there's a tremendous degree of courage there, and there's a tremendous degree of the proactivity engaged Buddhism. So these are so inspiring for the many of the people like us. <clears throat> so let me conclude by saying that if you have to really remember these great monsters, we need to look at the, what they did in their life uh, to make a difference to the world, to make a difference to the world of the underprivileged, the, to the world of the, to the world where the war is being discouraged, where the dialogue is being encouraged and the venerable <clears throat> Kimalkan, he rightly embodies all these qualities. So let us all seek inspiration from this great monster that is, we can pray that the most venerable Kimalkan, please come back to the world, but why not? Why, the, why we only pray that he comes back? Why not the six, seven billion human beings, each one of us, if not all, at least one or the, or the Buddhists, why not each one of us carry the message, the torch of this venerable Pinatang forward, so they are like, say, at least like 300 million, 400 million, 500 million on the Buddhists, 500 million uh, Pinatang carry the legacy of this great monster. So let us see if this is possible. May the world find the light of the wisdom to see that the compassion alone is what makes the world happy and peaceful. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful sharing, Geshe La. I really appreciate your, um, how you mentioned these qualities of the Bodhisattva and how Thich Nhat Hanh really was able to embody that in his work and especially the point about how bodhisattvas show us the path and Thich Nhat Hanh showed us the path very clearly of engaged Buddhism and what that means for um, not only internal practice but in social action as well. And we have a question from one of our audience members um, who would like to know uh, more about uh, both, uh, both your Geshe La's uh, understanding and resonance and Venerable Tenzin Dezel with the core um, mindfulness trainings, the five and 14 mindfulness trainings that are the foundation of, of Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching and tradition um, and how, how you resonate with that as an expression of Thich Nhat Hanh's own energy and uh, your thoughts on, the, on those core teachings of the five and 14 mindfulness trainings. So, thank you. The question was from uh, Francis, Francisca Ortel, I hope I pronounced your name right, but thank you. Would you like to begin, Geshe-la? Okay, then, the Angela, you can. Okay. You can begin. Okay, thank you. Well, when I stayed with his community in Hong Kong on Lantau Island, I had never really come across them. I mean, we in, in our tradition in Vajrayana Buddhism, although we both fall under the umbrella of Mahayana, Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism has its own you know, kind of Shedra's system, college system and teachings that we follow. So of course we have mindfulness and awareness in our own practices. But when I stayed with the bhikkhunis and bhikkhus on, in Plum Village on Lantau in Hong Kong, I found the booklet with the 14 core practices and the five mindfulnesses. And I actually copied them down by hand in my notebook because I thought they were really so compelling. And of course we have to start with the individual mindfulness practice that's, that's where the other, all the 14 have to come then into community. But we have to start every day with the mindfulness. Really, I start as a holiness that Dalai Lama suggests we do, saying how wonderful when I wake up in the morning, how wonderful I have another day to practice. As Ty said, another fresh 24 hours. Because we don't know when the Lord of death is coming. We do know that life is impermanent and uncertain. And we will have to give up the causes and conditions of this life. So the first mindfulness of just recognizing you have 
not just a human life that is, is of itself wonderful, but a precious human life, meaning you've come in contact with the teachings of the Buddha and the Dharma. So starting your day off every day with this fresh awareness, this mindfulness of having a precious human life, having guidelines of uh, ethics of morality that, that govern our body, speech, and mind, having the mindfulness of knowing where one's mind still is training and, and needing to perfect itself and putting more attention to that area, doing a review of consciousness and conscience that shows us not to, not to, one of the qualities as Geshe-la mentioned of all the beautiful qualities of Thai of Thich Nhat Hanh was his great humility. You know, that he, he just walks so quietly and simply because of these 14 practices, which constantly call one to review the, the purity, the virtue of one's body, speech, and mind. And so, for example, in, in the temple of his holiness, the Dalai Lama, right up behind his throne on the wall, is the plaque that is really the main teaching of the Buddha that, that is the foundation of, of the five mindfulnesses and the 14 mindfulnesses, which is do not commit any non-virtuous acts, commit only pure virtuous acts, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Now, all those mindfulnesses are right there in that instruction. What, what Tai did with the 14 mindfulnesses was break out first how to start with oneself, watching body, speech, and mind, being a presence of compassion, loving kindness, of holding noble silence, of coming back to recognizing mindfulness in all of those qualities of body, speech, and mind. And then these 14 were also then spread in terms of how to work and live in community to continually come back, learn how to have a mindful dialogue, learn then again how to review starting always with oneself, then moving into community, holding space for others to have a difference of opinion, holding genuine respect that that opinion might teach you something. What can we learn from others? So I wrote, hand wrote these 14 mindfulnesses down in my journal so that I, and I do go back to them because they're very valid guidelines for our own practice. And then when our own, really our own mindfulness is our only thing we can really take responsibility for to change is ourself. There's only one we can change in this whole wide world. It's our own way we're moving in our body, the only way we're using our speech and those being a reflection of a loving, kind, wise, compassionate, aware and awake mind that's present. And so if this is what we bring into every interaction, no matter who's in front of us and, and when we're alone. So in our practice, we say, when alone, guard your mind, when with others, guard your speech. These other 14 will naturally come into being met. But as we're training, so we call our Buddhist Dharma our practice. We practice not just when we're sitting alone, doing our prayers and our sadhanas, our commitments, but when we're really training we're in community with others. And so these 14 mindfulnesses are wonderful guidelines that then delineate even further what we can be aware of, what we need to stay attuned to. But in my own, my own honesty is that I, I do write these things out personally so that I have them in a journal, I come back to them. But if I really think of the simplicity of the practice, it's always to just check up, is my body peaceful? Is my speech kind, clear, calm, and also holding noble silence? And is my mind full of, of loving kindness and compassion? And are all of these governed by the wisdom, the view that sees the true nature of the reality? And if all those things are my main practice, then these five mindfulnesses and these 14 mindfulnesses Will, will naturally be unfolding very nicely. But they are worthwhile to study. They are worthwhile to learn, for sure. Thank you very much, Venerable Sons of Basil, and I, I appreciate your reflections there. And Geshe La, if you also have any thoughts on these um, two core teachings of uh, Venerable Tikhan Han, please, please share them. Okay. 
Um, so basically, um, I don't want to go too much into this. Um, when we speak about the mindfulness, uh, what is important is that the, uh, let's say, uh, the mindfulness per se, and then how the mindfulness, uh, there is somebody teaches in the form of five mindfulnesses, 14 mindfulnesses, it doesn't matter. So we have to know what is mindfulness and why do we need, need that? Mindfulness, which is the, has been very popular, actually it has two elements, people mix up with two things. Number one is introspection, and then number two is mindfulness. These two are mixed up. And the, if you don't distinguish the two well, then the, um, it becomes like a hotspot. It's not um, a good practice. So first, to keep an eye on your own mind, to see what your mind is doing. Then the next is that if you see that your mind is not doing properly, pull the mind and put it in the proper track, perspective, so that the, the first one, introspection, that is like keeping an eye on your mind, like spying on your mind. And the mindfulness is like the rope to pull the mind back to the object. So that is very important. Once you have this, then the mindfulness should be seen in. Then once you know this mindfulness in the form of two aspects combined together, introspection and mindfulness, then the next part is that the, the, this should be seen as one in the form of container and the other form of contents. The container, let's say, for example, okay, I'm mindful of, I'm, I'm talking, I should be, you know, I should be, I'm talking, okay, now I'm raising my hand. This is just very neutral. The training in mindfulness is very neutral in nature. Whereas the, the content wise is missing. So now, once you have this mindfulness, then the mindfulness must be directed with the rich content. This is so important. Nowadays with practice mindfulness, this is what is missing. They just focus on the mere neutral mindfulness without the contents. For example, let's say that the, I sleep with my head at the pointing my uh, pointing to the east and my feet to the uh, to the west. And it so happens that my teacher, my teacher's residence is the, uh, to the to the west. You should want mindful of that. Oh no. My, I'm putting my feet towards my teacher. This is not good. So even though your pillow is on the, the east side, then you shift the pillow to the west and your mind is your your head is towards the teacher. So that is not only the mindfulness, but it is a rich content matter. This is important. And then, for example, let's say, okay, so I have the Buddha statue here, and I put my feet in this direction. No, you should not. Otherwise, okay, now I'm tired. I will, okay, now I'm, I'm sleeping. I'm mindful that I'm sleeping. And your feet is directed towards the Buddha. These are all where you have mindfulness, but you are losing the content of the mindfulness. This is so important. So, in other words, I don't want to, to, to take too much of the time here. Let's not forget anybody who's interested, be it the, the mindfulness practice of uh, the according to whether the Kirnakam or the according to Goengaji or according to any tradition, it doesn't matter. There should be two things mindfulness per se plus the rich content matters. Let's not forget the rich content matters. Oftentimes, this is what is being missed. And the Buddha taught, for example, said the four seals, all composite things in but be mindful. That all composite things in but it's not just that okay now I'm, I'm putting my hand up I'm putting my hand down now I'm putting the first leg I'm raising the second leg it's not just that there's a rich quantum matter there with this mindfulness use it to remember all composite things in permanent all contaminated things stuff in nature then the wisdom that everything is like a dream everything is empty of true existence so. We should not forget anybody who is interested in, in any form of practice mindfulness. We should not forget the rich contents which are to be, we must be, which must not be missed in the practice mindfulness. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the clarity there, Yashila. I appreciate you how you um, 
yes, really drive, drive exactly to the point of what mindfulness is in its essence. And uh, we, we must be careful not to get lost in, in numbers and really have sharp clarity of what the, what the concept and practice is like experientially. So thank you. And if we have any other questions from our audience, um, please feel free to ask them in, in the chat or on our Facebook stream. Um, I believe we have time for about uh, one more audience question. And um, if no one has one, I, I have one for eat both of our speakers. And it, it relates to um, really Thich Nhat Hanh's, what I feel is the, the blazing energy of his, of his presence that has been left behind, which is this incredible movement of engaged by Buddhism. There's different words for um, what I think is essentially the same act of taking the Buddhist practice and using it in the world as a, as a method for not only individual liberation, but societal and uh, being able to release ourselves from structures that are um, causing untold amounts of suffering in the world. And so I would like to know each of, from each of our speakers, how your understanding of engaged Buddhism has been influenced and um, developed through your uh, awareness and reading or practice in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh um, as also a way for our audience to learn more about um, perhaps even the Vajrayana perspective on engaged Buddhism. So thank you. Well, I want to yield to Gishala to, to begin with that one, please, Gishala. It was so beautiful and profound the way you located mindfulness within the actual vessel and practice of Buddhism. That's its most rich form. Please, you, you begin with this answer. Okay. Um, so basically, um, engaged Buddhism, this is extremely important. And we see that the broadly speaking, uh, for the, all the, the viewers, it's very important for us to know the, what is the, the real Buddhism. Real Buddhism, we see that there are two traditions. One is the Theravada, the Theravada um, Buddhism and the Mahana Buddhism. And uh, the, so basically the, the basic principle, while the foundations are the same, but depending on what is power the those that you find in the terrible tradition, this point, the goal is to achieve personal liberation. And uh, by no means this is to the, uh, the demean somebody, but this is a fact. And when I was in Thailand um, five years ago, I just indicated this to one of the, the Thai great masters. And then his student very clearly told me that we don't aspire to become Buddhas, we only aspire to become Arahant, means personal, I say, we see personal emotion. And then whereas those who aren't, let's not forget, okay, first let me just delineate the, the basic, the concept. Whereas in my ideal speaking, it should think of the achieving full enlightenment, Buddhahood, for the benefit of all the beings. So they are, then the, uh, say, the emphasis on the engaged Buddhism, Buddhism into action, in action. That becomes uh, very pertinent. So with this in mind, having said this, we have to keep in mind that within the Theravada the masters, there are some who are really, really Buddhist artists. I know some of my I say, the, the friends who are abbots of Theravada tradition, and yet what they're doing is just on a large scale benefit to the community. This is amazing, great examples. Okay, so now the point is that engaged person, um, say, in whatever way we can be of some help to other beings. First thing is to keep in mind that fix yourself. We have to fix ourselves and then see how you can engage to benefit others. If you don't fix yourself, say, and the Bodhisattva Arimantriya, what he indicated is that which means the Bodhicitta, the basic principle of the Mahayana practice is to wishing to achieve full enlightenment to benefit all the beings. So this is how he categorized what the Bodhicitta is. With this in mind, 
first you have to first how somehow you need to have to see what is wrong within you why you cannot do things the way the Buddhist Sacrament did why you cannot do things the way the say the his holiness the Dalai Lama is doing why we cannot do things the way that the most valuable Kanakan is doing so there we see that there are two demons inside us which identify that one is the cognitive the cognitive uh, the error within us which views things are so objectified and so solidified in other words self-grasping ignorance and the other which is self-centered attitude which always thinks about the self obsessed with the self these are the two demons which which stop us from engaging from say making the buddhism engaged with the world so the way he did the way he's going to do now. So why we can't do that is because of these two things. We have to fix the things to the best you can, and then meanwhile, see how much we can engage with him or so both. I do we don't try, we don't even see that these two demons are within us. Then in the facade, in the facade of engaging to help, to help the world or maybe what you call as engaged Buddhism, there's every danger that you seek your own personal fame, personal gain. I did this, we did this, and so forth. This is very, very poisonous. We should be very careful. And in particular, the people who engage, who, who are actively into the engaged Buddhism, for them, the first thing that we, they should not forget, they should always remember be mindful is that I should not be swayed by my personal fame. That is so important. That the two demons are within me. Whatever I do, it should be for to help others. First, help myself to, to remove my two demons. That is so important. Without this, people may be carried away by this engaged Buddhism, engaged Buddhism, engaged Buddhism, and actually they are fighting amongst themselves. We did it. No, you, you do not do that. We did that. So this is where we can go wrong. But overall speaking, I have deep, deep, deep respect to anybody who in action um, takes or be a great part of the engaged Buddhism, where they fix the two demons inside, they remove the two demons, or completely or partially, at least they should see that these are demons. These two are not to be encouraged. So with this in mind, and they go out, engage, and let this person be engaged with other beings in service of humanity. Thank you. That's that's really uh, very profound and beautiful what Gishala is sharing. He's saying we have to engage with the Buddhas of practice that we have first inside of our own heart minds. And to really check up, you said the two demons, I'll say the eight worldly concerns, you know, is the kind of the two columns of four, staying away from grasping for pleasure and avoiding pain, grabbing for gain, not wanting loss, grabbing for fame, staying away from infamy, wanting only to hear praise and, and rejecting blame. That if we're always swinging still between these eight worldly concerns, we're not gonna be able to engage very effectively at all. So as Geshe is saying, like the first step of engaged Buddhism is to, I, I believe the Tibetans have the saying, the eyes look outward and see everyone, everything but themselves. And in engaged Buddhism, we have to turn the gaze inward first to see again, how we can really um, follow the Buddha Dharma purely with our own ethics totally intact. Um, then we bring in that mindfulness. And as Geshe said, if whether it's five mindfulness or 14 mindfulness, doesn't matter, but the mindfulness that does check up and, and walks the path clean, clear. So part of the 14, the part of the 14 mindfulness, one of the mindfulnesses is, is to constantly review, look back over the last week. I mean, monastics do this twice a month. We have sojung. So practices of always checking up, you know, to make sure how will we know if our ego is really the thing that's driving us for the name and fame and pleasure and gain. If we don't check up, we have to check up. So we need a practice to, to be really honest about our pure motivation. So three words when I first walked into a Buddhist, little Buddhist 
tiny studio here that that my teacher Kensor Rinpoche was teaching in. It was before he became a Kempo. Maybe he had just finished his Geshe degree. The three quote, the quote from the Buddha that said, believe nothing, no matter who has said it, even if I myself have said it, unless it accords with your own knowing the Buddha. And then underneath it said, pure intention, pure motivation and pure dedication. And again, why do we want to walk the path? Because it's a pure benefit, not just for oneself, but first of all, to all others. We're only one. All others are countless, innumerable. But it will be of mutual benefit to be carrying a pure motivation through the practice of the Dharma. First, we practice, we do our practice with a pure heart, and then we can see how we can effectively share that joy actually the joy of the dharma share that promise of the dharma with others through loving kindness through thinking about where is it applicable so the the group in hong kong i stayed with at plum, plum village has what they're calling applied buddhism which means meeting with community groups helping them learn meditation breathing in breathing out creating peace of mind doing peaceful walking meditation creating peace through movement not even talking about Buddhism initially, but just caring about helping others who are living in Hong Kong, a big urban environment, learn how to touch peace, how to touch serenity. That, that really is just helping them learn how to create that kindness and calmness within their own experience. This is a very simple kind of engaged Buddhism, but very effective. And then once they actually get some benefit from just doing simple practice, breathing in, breathing out, doing the practice, they start to think more about, well, what is Buddha's teaching? What is the real essence of the teaching? So yes, we, we do start with oneself, but we see in a very general, very universal way of how we can apply or engage with our practice. Um, going into schools, something that we do here is just going into schools and even looking like this, the public schools, but never talking about Buddhism, but helping the teachers, helping the students learn how to sit quietly for five minutes, silently breathing in, breathing out, creating a sense of peace in the classroom, a sense of harmony, a sense of togetherness where they're going to engage as a teacher and as a student to create a vessel for good learning. Now, eventually they'll continue with that practice of breathing in, breathing out, learning meditation, wanting to know more about how to create peace naturally. It may lead them again to Buddha Dharma, but the first connection is just a pure motivation to wanting others to be able to live with peace and happiness, kindness, serenity, and joy. So this kind of engaged Buddhism that we talk about now in the West of the Eco Dharma I don't agree necessarily with all the focus and the panic around the climate change, because if you bring a panicked mind to anything you're doing, even if you say I'm a bodhisattva, I'm an ecosattva, I'm a Buddhist, well, who's that I? You've got an agenda. So first start with your own internal ecology, your internal dharmic environment that's full of the pure motivation, for, full of your practice, doesn't have any egoic drive behind it other than wanting to create harmony, wanting to create opportunities to engage that are of benefit to the greatest good, but not to get money out of that, not to make a name out of that, not to have the greatest newest concept on the internet out of that, not at all. That's not a pure motivation. Yes, you can do and should do all the things that are in harmony with the Buddha's teachings that are nonviolent, that create a balance in the world, that bring this intention of reducing harm through consumption, through habits. We can find many great practices to just personally engage with our own practice and make these lifestyle changes one by one by one with that pure motivation. And as Geshe said, when we're actually meeting in groups like with INEB, I'm part of INEB of the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, when we have retreats a few years ago in Taiwan, INEB decided as a group this year, we want only female monastics for the first time to lead our retreats because they haven't had that opportunity before. And so it was a collective agreement and everybody rejoiced. Everyone agreed that this was, would be beneficial and to choose someone from the Theravadan, someone from the Mahayana, kind of Zen Mahayana, and then someone from the Vajradhara 
uh, Tibetan background. And I was blessed to go because they really had requested Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo to go and she couldn't go. And then she requested me to go in her place. And what, what a wonderful opportunity to just be seeing how this kind of engaged Buddhism, how masters also give their disciples different opportunities to serve without any kind of egoic attachment. And actually, I felt very humbled and really, you know, felt like I was there to learn more from INEB and from the way this community's working within itself to create new opportunities, new vision, to create social change, to create change even within the Dharma Sangha community by doing it very collectively, harmoniously, not with arguing and not with the, the nuns or the bhikkhunis saying, you know, it's not fair, you never give us a space, we're not treated equally, no just by being able to show up when there's an invitation to fill that space with a genuine motivation, a pure motivation, and then to recognize there's no one there that needs a gender praise. There's no one there that needs to have their tradition be the best tradition. There, that's all kind of an egoic clinging so that we really show up purely, working with everyone who's there harmoniously and coming away from all the labels of competition and the egoic drive to just really create the highest happiness, the greatest good. And again, this is what I really see that Thich Nhat Hanh did so beautifully in creating his Sangha communities in his walk and his writings. And I wanna mention also in his beautiful artwork. So some of the things we did when I stayed with the bhikkhunis in Plum Village was one was just doing his beautiful calligraphy, learning his style and then inviting me to share with her and doing some beautiful just brush strokes in silence together, sometimes laughing sweetly, like something looked, 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 we thought was a mistake and then it kind of looked okay and being playful about it, but being serious about our concentration, but playful and joyful in our hearts. And so, um, you know, engaged Buddhism could look very simply like a few years later, staying with people in, in New Zealand and, and one of the lay people there was learning calligraphy herself. And she said, oh, Tenzin Dasel, come and please, you make one calligraphy for me. And I said, oh, I really haven't done it for some years, but I, but I enjoy it. So if, if I can play with it a little bit as a meditation, then I engaged with it, you see? And then she said, please, I really request, you know, just make something for me. And I thought, I not really an artist, I can't do this, but the only thing that came to mind was to just draw a heart, you know, in this Thich Nhat Hanh style with the brush and ink, and then in the middle of it, just write the word today, and she loved it, and the basic thing that was the message was just love today, that's the best way to engage in Buddhism, become that love, become that light, become that awakened presence that's there for everyone to share that with, using your wisdom, using your compassion in very simple, humble ways. And if we do this, each of us well, we will transform this entire planet that way. I, I agree, this is His Holiness the Dalai Lama when Venerable Master Thich Nhat Hanh passed away, signed the, his letter of, of regret of hearing the news and of his wish saying the best way we can honor Master Thich Nhat Hanh's legacy is by be carrying that torch, as Geshe Le said, carrying that torch of peace further in the world, becoming that light ourselves, being that presence of loving kindness just today and making that day every day. Deep gratitude to both of our speakers for this incredibly insightful understanding and reflection on what engaged Buddhism means through the lens of Thich Nhat Hanh's work. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, the key to genuine world peace is inner peace. And this, is, this encapsulates the, this understanding of engaged Buddhism. In order to be effective in the world, we have to be peaceful. And in the end, I would I'd be very grateful if um, our speakers would be able to perhaps dedicate the merit of this meeting um, in celebration of Thich Nhat Hanh's life um, and are, are gathering together to reflect on his teachings. Um, if you would be able to of this meeting, I would be incredibly grateful and we can close uh, with that perhaps. So thank you very much for your time, energy and attention and uh, thank you. Gishala, please offer the dedication.
Okay. Uh, the, so basically, let us pray that uh, the, the most valuable thing about Hans' legacies um, be seen by the people in the form of courage, in the form of knowledge, and in the form of compassion, and in the form of in integrity, and that each one of us make a commitment that uh, these the qualities are being manifested within yourself and then shine to his others. Let us pray that His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who feels that the most valuable thing that has legacies must be carried and devoured by all people who really revered him. And let us pray that these enlightened beings, such as his holiness, live long and that is that is and that his wishes are both responsibilities to him. And let us pray that finally the teaching of the Buddha, the message of the compassion, the message, the message of the truthfulness, and the message of the wisdom, and the rich, every nook and corner of the world, that the minds of all the demons and beings, that nobody should suffer, nobody should live in fear, that this COVID-19 subsides altogether, and that there should be <clears throat> no inequality in terms of gender, in terms of the the wealth in terms of the social status and in terms of power and so forth, may everybody enjoy the equality as the Buddha wished and prayed. Yes, uh, these are my prayers, and let us all pray in the, the, the same way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Geshe. And I just add to that dedication that may the sweetness and mindfulness, profoundness, peace, loving kindness, and practices of Plum Village waft across the earth endlessly until samsara is emptied for the benefit and happiness of all beings and the pure continuation of the Dharma as Thai's legacy to light up countless lives and heart minds until samsara is completely emptied. I pray in that snow mountain and circled land, source of every benefit and joy, may Lord Tenzin Gyatso Chenrezig Rezig remain in life until samsara's end. Jangchup Semchok Rinpoche, Makepa Nam Ke Gyorchi, Kepar Nimpar Mepar Yang, Gone Gongdu Pelwar Shog, in the great Bodhisattva tradition of Thich Nhat Han, as well as of the Vajrayana, this translates into English as Bodhi mind, precious and sublime. May it arise where it has not arisen, and where it has arisen, may it flourish and grow forevermore. May we all attain complete enlightenment for the benefit and happiness of all mother sentient beings. I want to say thank you so much to most venerable Geshe Dorje Damdula. It's a very humbling and honoring experience to be on a panel with you. I, I really am happier and more comfortable sitting as a student there at Tibet House listening <laughs> to your teachings. But thank you very much for the opportunity to share together. It was really a, a great honor to be here with you. And thank you again to INEB and to Dexter for organizing this and for the precious opportunity to be able to share some thoughts. Hope to see you again sometime soon, Geshe-la, maybe at the Tibet house there. Okay, thank you, Venerable Desera, thank you so much. And thank you, Dexter. Thank you all the members of INEP. Thank you so much and all the viewers. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Geshe-la. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you. Our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thanks everybody for joining in, giving your precious time and interest. And yes, of course, thanks to INEB and to Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo for the connection that initially brought me to INEB.
Thank you all for attending. We will have a recording of the session uh, available on IAB's uh, website and YouTube channel um, uh, within the week. And uh, please reach out if you have any uh, feedback on the event. Um, and thank you all very much for your time, energy, and attention. I really appreciate uh, your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yes, peaceful transformation of the heart question. Great. Ending the meeting now. Have a good night, everyone.